this is going to have a very curious title. I've called this Sowing the Seed Within Secularity Today, The Soil, The Sowers, and then The Sower with a capital S. Sowing the Seed Within Secularity Today, The Soil, The Sowers, and The Sower. I'm going to begin with a little parable, a um, very important parable, one of the central parables of Jesus' teaching where he says, a sower went out to seed. Okay, the sower is obviously God. The seed is the word. He said, the sower went out to seed and it kind of seeded indiscriminately. So he said, some of the seed fell on the road where the birds came and ate it. Some fell in thorns and when he grew up, the thorns choked it out. Some fell in sandy soil, which had no depth, but because it didn't have any depth, it grew really fast. But then as soon as the sun came out, it got scorched. And some fell into good soil and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, our temptation when we read this text is to think, you know, uh, um, well, Jennifer is kind of the rocky soil. Uh, this other guy, he's kind of the, the, the roadside. These people, they're that soil. When actually the parable means this, that we all have all those soils within ourselves. So that inside of us, there is a road where the birds eat the seed. There are thorns that choke out God's word. There is sandy soil where it grows up in enthusiasm and soon withers and dies in the heat. And there's also good soil where the word grows 30, 60, and 100 fold. So that all the seed is inside of us. What I want to do this afternoon, I want to talk about the Western context, secularity as a soil. Okay? So that, you know, we're trying to sow the seed inside the soil of secularity. I want to talk a little bit about the soil. Then I want to talk about the sowers at their best and their worst. Uh, that's us. We're going out there with our liberal ideologies and ecclesiologies, conservative ideologies and ecclesiologies, and I want to talk about when we're at our top of our game and when we're at the worst of our game. And I'll try to be fair to both sides. Then I want to talk about the sower, Jesus, uh, and what we can learn that transcends our efforts for sowing. So we'll begin with the soil, the context of the West today. And by the West, I don't mean west of the Mississippi, but the Western world, North America, um, and the Western parts of Asia, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, um, parts of um, South Korea that are highly, highly secularized places. Okay. Um, what's our context? Well, as we saw, Western culture, secular culture, it's both a culture of death and a culture of life. So this afternoon, I want to just put a different terminology. It's a culture that receives and it's a culture that resists God's word. There are powerful elements of receptivity inside of our culture that make us ripe for the gospel. <laughs> and there's powerful areas of resistance that make our culture resist the gospel. And I'm going to name them more than explain them. In terms of receptivity, our culture is strong in these senses. First of all, there's a powerful interest in spirituality inside of secular culture. You could probably make a pretty good living today by running a spiritual bookstore. Uh, you know, people are interested in spirituality. Spirituality books do well, and especially books that just hint on the edges of pseudo-spirituality, the Da Vinci Code and so on, they do really, really, really well. You know, and so that you know, there is a whole itch and an interest that people know that there's something beyond just the pragmatic and the material. Also, as we saw with the statistics I gave you earlier, God and Christ and religion have great staying power. People are not abandoning God in great numbers. They're not abandoning Christ in great numbers, and they're not even abandoning their churches in great numbers. Now, they're not going to their churches in great numbers. But, you know, God, Christ, the church, they're pretty stable, and that's good news. Then also, as we saw, our, our secular culture has made some wonderful moral gains. Uh, sometimes we, um, we don't read history very well. And sometimes the temptation is, is to glorify and idealize the past. We talk, for instance, the golden age of Christianity. There were some wonderful things during the golden age. There were some dreadful things during the golden age. The golden age was a lot more golden for some than for others, you know wasn't very golden if you were a slave. It wasn't very golden if you were uh, a woman. It wasn't very golden for a lot of other people 
was very golden for some, and yet they were the saints, it was a wonderful age. But our age has its own strengths. It has its own blindnesses. Areas like abortion, euthanasia, pornography, drugs, sexual responsibility, family responsibility, community breakdown, those are bad areas. Nobody should try to justify that, okay? But at the same time, where we are growing, we're growing in the area of, we're better off in terms of race, we're better off in terms of sexism, we're better off in terms of tolerance. As a simple example, you know, it took Christianity, all of Christianity, more than 1,800 years to get slavery. It's an incredible thing. The Christians and many saints, but it took between 18 and 1,900 years before Christians could say unequivocally, slavery is wrong. And during the golden age, of, you know, so-called golden age, we believed in slavery. It wasn't good at all. Now, they had other wonderful qualities, but they were racist and so on. Um, I think we just have to, for purposes of honesty, admit that so we don't over-glamorize the age of cathedral. And we used to go out and try to kill Arabs and call it the crusade, kill people for Jesus. Not a good thing. Not a good thing. Okay. Um, so today, we've made some moral gains or sexism. It's taken us 2,000 years, and we haven't fully gotten the women's issues yet. Although, to our credit, we've gotten it better than every other culture on the planet. The status of women within Western society is the highest of any place in the world. Now, it's still not full equality, but we're getting there. That's a moral gain. And then lastly, and quite simply is, and you'll recognize that in your families, your kids, your acquaintances, we have produced just a lot of good decent people. <laughs> and sometimes your kids, they may not go to church, follow every rule of the church, but oftentimes they're wonderful, decent, good people that are wonderful to be with. They're highly moral in their own way. Uh, they're selective in certain areas and so on. Uh, but they're not murderers and they're not cruel and they have a, um, for instance, one of the wonderful things. You know what are a lot of our kids now? They're colorblind. Racial difference make no difference whatsoever. That's a massive moral gain. Um, see, so we've slid in some areas, but in some other areas, you know, we are producing decent, honest, wonderful people that you want to have dinner with and you want to have holding your hand when you die. That's not a bad thing at all, okay? That's its receptivity. It's receiving the gospel. Now, it's resistances. And again, I'll just name the ones quite quickly. It's, um, there is a culture of, of where there's just a massive ecclesial diminishment, graying and empty churches. This is a culture, as I say, that is not very friendly to the churches. Uh, it's friendly every place, but it's not a friend of the church necessarily. There's a growing marginalization of the churches. And also inside of Western culture, there's a strong anti-ecclesial and anti-clerical stream right within the culture that should be named. Conservatives name it, and they're right. You know, our culture many times, even though it's a Christian culture, is anti-Christian. In, and it's anti-clerical, okay? We could look at reasons for that, but it just is. And also that for many people in our culture, the church, or any of the mainline churches, were perceived as old, tired, and lacking. You know, there's this, <laughs> the church, it's been there, people have done that, we're old, we're tired, uh, people want to look elsewhere. And then the, the adolescent grandiosity inside of secularity. We looked at that earlier. There's a powerful adolescence. Secularity right now is feeling its oats as a young teenager and so on in terms of um, we've made all these achievements in spite of the churches and you're in the way and so on. That's where the anti-clericalism and anti-ecclesial comes in. Now, a couple of others to name, very important. And that is what I like to call the death of public life in our culture. Uh, and the excessive individuality. One of the things we struggle with, and, and, and all sociologists and sociologists of religion and sharp analysts today, they name that. The, the, the reason why the churches are struggling so much in our society, the biggest reason of all is the death of public life. Now, what's public life? Well, sociologists will tell you that we have three kinds of life. You know, and they're all three important. You have your life of intimacy. That's life inside of your family, life inside of your marriage, life inside of your religious community, or life inside, you know, when you're out for dinner with your closest friends. That's your intimate life. Then you have your civic life. You're an American citizen. You vote. 
you get involved in politics and so on. You vote for city aldermen and you vote for mayors and presidents and so on. There's a whole public life of politics that happens and the judicial system and so on. But in between you have something called public life, or at least we're supposed to. Public life are your neighbors. Notice you don't pick your neighbors. They're dealt to you when you buy your house. Okay, Your neighbors, your in-laws, uh, and your parish, and your civic clubs. Notice that's not your intimate life. Your neighbors aren't your intimates. It's just your neighbors. Your parish isn't your intimate. That's your parish. And classically, all denominations have made parishes until recently. They were geographical. They would simply take the boundaries from, you know, 7th Street to 19th Avenue to this and so on. That becomes St. Matthew's Parish. And you weren't asked, well, I may not like the people who are there. It's a tough. That's your parish. So Garrison Keillor just had a, a very good line on his, his Lake Wabagan uh, tales the other day. He says, uh, one of the women, Lutheran, classical Lutheran, Minnesota, said uh, um, she was scared um, about going to heaven in case she wouldn't end up in the right section of heaven. <laughs> she said, well, what if I end up in the Mormon section and they don't have coffee? <laughs> heck of a price to pay for eternal life, you know? <clears throat> See, parish is just dealt to you. What if you don't like it? Doesn't matter. Same with your neighbor. You move in. These are your neighbors. You just have to deal with them. Except today we don't. See, today what we do, we've become more and more where we have our intimate life, family, friends you choose, and your civic life, and nothing in between. So you don't know your neighbors. Just have, you know, you nod politely when you go by. And you don't have neighborhoods. And it's even the way we build our houses. You ever notice how houses are built differently today than a generation or two ago? You used to build a house with a front porch. And you'd sit out at night and, and see, because life happens at the front of the street. And other neighbors are out on their front porch, and strollers are going up and down, and people would socialize. Now the front is barricaded, and you have a fence at the back, and you're just having a barbecue with just your family. Uh, there's no space for neighbors. But notice parishes and church life is neighborhood. And you also get in the theologies today where people will say, I can't worship with a big community, a thousand people. How do we know each other and so on? See, we're getting intimate life mixed up with, with public life. And today there's simply a, most of our public life in our culture has died. So it's not just the church that's feeling it. Families are feeling it, civic clubs, from Elks clubs to Knights of Columbus to whatever, are struggling because, you know, uh, pe people want their lives private and civic and nothing in between. And so one, one of the things that, is, that really needs to be named, and there's a certain resistance to the gospel, because at a certain point the gospel is communal. See, when someone says, I'm spiritual, but I don't go to church, you can be spiritual and not go to church. You can't be Christian and not go to church. See, Christianity is by essence a communal endeavor that partly you do together. Christianity precisely calls you to be a community of neighbors and so on. Uh, and that's the part that's hurting. That's the part. And you see it in our kids, not just in their, their lack of commitment to church, in their lack of commitment to the institution of marriage. When kids say, we don't need to get married, we can just live together, and they're good, sincere kids. See, they don't understand the communal nature of this. This is just between her and me. No, it is. It's between her and me and your families and society and so on. Whenever I marry people, and I'm doing a marriage this weekend, you know, I always start this way. You know, I'm the minister, the priest, and I'll say, now, on behalf of Jack and Jennifer and their families, I welcome you here to this wonderful gathering. Then I turn to the couple, I say, now, on behalf of the community of man and, and society of the church, I welcome you to your wedding. Because this is a private thing. You're not redefining your relationship to each other. You're redefining your relationship to everybody. See, this is a community thing. See, today, most kids don't get that. Most adults don't get that. It's no wonder we perish struggle and so on. We just have an excessive individuality. And there's so many good books, clever books written on this from you know, non-ecclesial perspectives. Remember the book called Bowling Alone? You know, so, you know just, you know, we used to belong to bowling leagues and so on. You go with your, your family and so on. Now you bowl alone. Um, see, it's, it's something I do alone. So today we could write a book called Religion Alone. Um, 
That's, that's the struggle. There's an excessive individuality in our culture. And then lastly and importantly, our culture is resistance because of simply its sheer intoxicating power. I heard an interview on N NPR radio some weeks ago and or months ago. And they were interviewing this journalist and his wife, an American, who are now living in New York, but had lived in Paris as journalists for 11 years. And while they were in Paris, their youngest, or their son was born. They only had the one child. And he was now nine years old. But during the first nine years of his life, they didn't own a television set. He didn't know what an iPod was. He was completely out of the loop of pop American culture. Probably didn't know who Michael Jackson was or whoever, okay. Now they moved back to America, to New York. And so the journalist said to, or the interviewer said to the journalist, has your son held out against popular American culture? And he said, for about two days. So of course he didn't hold out. He said, nobody holds out. Then he coined this expression. He says, pop culture today in the West is the most powerful narcotic that has ever been perpetrated on this planet, for good and for bad. It's true. Popular culture. Hollywood, Microsoft, McDonald's, Starbucks, videos, Blockbuster, iPods, and on and on. That's the most powerful narcotic that has ever been perpetrated on this planet, both for good, there's a lot of wonderful things in there, and for bad. You know, it's, it's making us the most efficient, communicative, and touch people, and free people in the history of humanity. Okay? And all of that is good. The downside is this. It's leading to a lot, to my mind, lack of contemplativeness and interiority. We're all going to eventually have partial attention deficit disorder because we're going to be so attentive to everything, and we are already trying to be so attentive to everything and to so many things that we're deeply attentive to nothing. We're not really de de deeply attentive to anything. The poet, the Sufi mystic Rumi, has this great line where he says, I have lived too long where I can be reached. That's us today. We're all living where we can be reached. The cell phone, the iPod, the Skype, whatever. You can't travel anymore. You can't take a vacation. You've got to stop, check your email. Your cell phone's going and so on. There's something wonderful about that, but it's also, we don't realize this is changing, our, it's changing the way we think. And it's not necessarily going to lead to spiritual depth. Okay. And in, in, in that sense, as I say here, it constitutes a certain conspiracy against interiority. That's a quote from one of my great Belgian professors, an old Dominican called Jan Walgrave. And he used to say, Western life right now constitutes a virtual conspiracy against interiority. Not that you know somebody's consciously conspiring. It's all these things and all this busyness and the power of this narcotic culture for us to just ever stop, to center to be unrestless, to, to be with our families, you know, classically, and many of you with kids, you know, to get a certain age, and it's a chore to have a meal together, because how soon can they get away from the table, and may they answer their cell phone at the table, and how soon can they get out of the house, it's just a, none of that is bad, it's just, it's a conspiracy against interiority, it's a conspiracy against being centered, and in that sense, it's a conspiracy against faith and the deeper things. Okay, that's its resistance. Now, Let's look at the next part. That's the soil. Now the sowers, as distinct from the sower I'll talk about later, is Jesus. We're the sowers. And I'm going to talk about the sowers at their best and the sowers at their worst. Okay? And I want to begin, um, Jim Wallace likes to say, there are only two taboo topics left, and sex isn't one of them. The two taboo topics are religion and politics. That's true. You can, you can joke about sex and you can talk safely about sex. You can't talk safely about religion and politics. So I'm going to use two jokes. They're out there now. They're kind of stock, but they, they illustrate. And they have a purpose. Usually I tell a joke, there's no purpose to it. Both of these have a purpose. One is going to be religious and one is going to be political. This is the religious joke. Okay? And don't throw anything until the joke is over because it evens <laughs> off. So you have a Democrat and a Republican. And they're having lunch on Capitol Hill. And the Republican says to the Democrat, he says, you know, you Democrats, you have completely lost your way religiously. You no longer allow, you know, God in public discourse. You're for gay marriage. You're for abortion. You don't allow prayer in the schools or the Ten Commandments at the courthouse. He said, I'll bet you you don't even know how to say the Lord's Prayer anymore. 
And the Democrat was very offended. He said, I know how to say the Lord's Prayer. He said, you put $100 out right now or retract this and I'll say the Lord's Prayer. So the Republican said, here's the $100, speak, say the Lord's Prayer. So the Democrat began, he says, now I lay me down to sleep. And the Republican said, damn, I didn't think you could do it. Okay. Okay. You get the message. Neither party, neither liberals or conservatives have a monopoly on God or morality. They both like to think they do. Okay. Now this is the political joke. Liberal and conservative. Okay. And there's somebody, let's make it um, Lake Michigan. There's somebody 200 yards offshore Lake Michigan and they're drowning. Okay. So the conservatives say they throw a rope. They're 200 feet out. The conservatives throw a rope that's 100 feet long and say, now we're doing our part, but you have to do something too. <laughs> you got to swim. You know, we can't do everything for you. And the liberals come along. They say, you know, these hard, you know, insensitive, callous, boorish conservatives, and they throw him 400 feet of rope, and then they let go of their end. Okay. <laughs> See, the moral of both those stories are both in religion and politics, not just it's not, not a question of whether you're Republican or Democrat, whether you're liberal or conservative, uh, Vatican II or John Paul II and so on. Um, none of us are doing this really well. None of us are doing it very well at all. Okay. Now, I want to do two things here. I'm going to start with the negative and I'll get to the positive. I want to do a little piece on conservatives at their worst and then liberals at their worst, then conservatives at their best and liberals at their best. So, this will be real fair, okay? Uh, and I'm going to try to be real honest and not pull any punches. So um, let's begin with the conservatives at their worst. And if you're conservative, hang on because the liberals are going to get it in about five minutes, okay? But you're going to get it first, okay? Now, conservatives at their worst, and you'll recognize all of that in yourself and others and so on. At their worst, what's wrong with conservative? It's mean-spirited, it's narrow, it's grandiose. Let's look at that. Mean-spirited, narrow, and grandiose. It sees, first of all, secularity as the enemy. That's the great enemy out there. Secularity is the enemy of the churches. It's the enemy of decency and value. And it sees secularity precisely as the culture of death. It's conservatism that coined that line. This is the culture of death. Secular culture is godless and it's a tyranny of relativity. You just have, it's, it's a new dictatorship. It's dictatorship of relativeness and so on. Okay. Then, what's its instinct? Its instinct is to protect to circumscribe, to re-entrench, to reduce ambiguity, and have clarity trump everything else. See, in, in conservative mindset, clarity is the Trump ace that trumps everything else. Be clear, no ambiguity. It's either this or it's that, it's this, bingo, you know? Now, and it has a litmus test. Liberals have their own litmus test. The litmus test for, for conservatives, you know it. Abortion and sexuality. Those are the two litmus areas. Okay, and if you're out of step there, you're a cafeteria Christian. Okay, now what what is it prone to? It's prone to fundamentalism and intolerance. You know, conservatives aren't known for the scope of their hearts. Okay, they are known for their values, as you'll see. Okay, it's prone to fundamentalism, intolerance. Okay, and its major fault is it's mean-spirited and it's prone to power. Uh, in this sense. It, to solve things by authority. If a conservative doesn't like you, you know what they'll do? They'll try to get you fired. And oftentimes they will. You know, play hardball. Don't like this priest, phone the bishop, get him out of here. You know, or he's working for this company, we'll put pressure on the sponsors, he's going to get fired. You know, you solve issues by authority, or we solve issues by authority. And in that sense, I get the little caption God and truth become a hammer. In conservatism, Truth is a sledgehammer. Remember the great, or the, well, the, he was a great saint, Robert Bella, he says that he was called the hammer of the heretics. You know, truth is a hammer. Truth brings down the hammer. Okay, that's conservatives at their worst. Now, liberals at their worst, what do they look like? Conservatives are mean, narrow, and grandiose. I forgot about the word grandiose. See, conservatives are always convinced that at this very moment they have to save the world. You know, if we don't, do this, the whole world is somehow going to go under. And that's why it's hyper-serious, and that's grandiosity, you know? You know, uh, if, if we don't kneel at communion or something, the whole world's going to fall apart, 
or if somebody goes to communion who isn't a Catholic and then somehow Catholicism is going to collapse or whatever, you know, um, that's conservatism at its worst. Now, liberals at their worst. They're not mean-spirited, narrow, and grandiose. They're naive, adolescent, and arrogant. So take your pick. Which do you want? You know, uh, mean-spirited, um, narrow, and grandiose, or naive, adolescent, and arrogant? Let's look at that. So how do they see secularity? They see secularity as the moral high ground. See, the churches should be learning from society what tolerance and race and all that stuff, it, it comes from, not from the churches and the scriptures, it comes from the world, the secular world is the high ground. And secularity is seen as the exclusive agent that has brought about the liberation of human freedom and freed us from animism, superstition, and false authority. And it's the agent that struggles against racism, sexism, forms of equality, and social injustice. That's all secularity. We're, we're the great social justice people. We freed up women and so on, um, forgetting its Judeo-Christian roots. The example I gave, Rosemary Ruther says, how can you be a feminist and be a Catholic? She says, hey, Catholicism, Judeo-Christianity gave us feminism. You know, um, the deep roots for these things are not secular. Secularity itself is the child of Christianity. Liberal, liberals are very quick to forget that. Conservatives deny that. Liberals just refuse to accept it. Okay. Now, its litmus test is precisely the opposite. The litmus test for bad conservatism is abortion and sexuality. It's the only issue. Here it's pro-choice and gay marriage. Those are the two. Um, if you want liberal credentials in strident circles, mm -hmm. that's what you have to be. You know, that's, that's it. Now, it's prone to secular fundamentalism and blind to its own roots. So um, conservatives are, are, are prone to a biblical and a kind of a narrow historical fundamentalism or a, a white or a racial fundamentalism. Uh, this is prone to a secular fundamentalism. And fundamentalism is the same no matter if it's right or left. It's a house with one room. These are the only values you're either in or out. Now its major fault is not so much power and mean-spirited, its major fault is intellectual intimidation and adolescent grandiosity. So that if a conservative doesn't like you, he'll try to get you fired, and probably will. If a liberal doesn't like you, they'll try to get you fired. They write an article in the Washington Post and New York Times, and they'll ridicule you and show you how backward and, you know, narrow you really are. You know, they won't try to get you fired, they'll just try to absolutely show you as a, a caveman um, who shouldn't be allowed to ever appear in public because you're too backward, uh, you're too narrow, and so on. Um, and with, with a certain grandiosity, you know, it's, it's liberals who use words like enlightenment. You see, we're enlightened and we got to raise your consciousness. You ever wonder how arrogant that sounds? Someone comes up to you and you're like, I'm here to enlighten you and to, <laughs> and to raise your consciousness. Well, if you have a double dig digit IQ, you're going to resist that and say, I thought I was awake. Um, <laughs> You know, see, that, that, that's adolescent, you know. I, I, I'm going to teach you to, to, to enter the, the 21st century and so on. Now, the major fault of conservatives is God and truth are a hammer. The major fault of liberals, strident liberals, is that God and truth are simply excluded from public discourse. That God and absolutes simply may not be allowed. You just can't talk about it. You simply can't talk about it, okay? Now, that's at their worst. That's at their worst. Okay, I'm glad nobody took a run at me at the podium because um, now it gets better. Each of them also brings a very important piece to the table. Um, so let's look now at conservatives at their best. What's the basic insight of conservatives? And oftentimes liberal don't get, liberals don't get this. This is where liberalism is naive and conservatism isn't. Their basic insight is energy isn't friendly. You know, Jung told us that. Jung said the greatest naivete within liberal culture is that liberals, we think energy is friendly and it's not. Energy will kill you. Energy needs taboos. Energy needs insulation, you know. And energy isn't, isn't abstract. Sexuality is this incredible wildfire on the planet. It says, oh, we don't need rules. People will just work it out. Now they're working it out. We're killing each other. And... Um, See, conservatives have to say, energy isn't friendly. They understand what God says to Moses on the mountain. 
when Moses said, I want to see your face, and God says, nobody can see my face and live. Think about that line. That's not just about physically seeing God. Archetypal energy, as Jung said, is just too powerful. For instance, what's wrong with pornography? What's wrong with pornography? See, a, a strident liberal will say, you know, sexuality is the most beautiful thing God created. And they're right. So why can't you watch it? For that very reason, it's too powerful. Nobody can see God's face and live. It's not meant to be watched, you know. And if you do, it's going to overinflate your grandiosity and you're either going to have to act out or you have to go into depression. Those are the only two choices that pornography leaves you. Conservatives get that. They don't always get it right, but by God, they get it, okay? Um, and also, the other instinct of conservatism that's healthy, energy isn't friendly, and don't go into dark, taboo places just because you can do it. See, one of the, the liberal fallacies is kind of, just because you can do it, we can do it. Just because you can, you can make a film that's, or write a book that just pushes the edges of everything, of pornography, of anything, it's good to do that. Well, you can do it. Um, you're going to pay a price for it. You know, you don't go into dark places just because you can go there. Okay, Jesus went into dark places to take God's light there. Give me a story from my own life where I understood this. And I was young. Um, I grew up, and even though we went to public school, we all grew up in this immigrant Catholic area and so on, and we had a pretty sheltered youth and pretty protected youth and so on. And right after high school, I went to the seminary. And one of my buddies, who were very close in high school, he didn't. He went off to the city, and within about two or three years, he, was, uh, he had stopped going to church. He had lived with a series of different women. He had shed all his Catholic roots and so on. And I was in the city one time doing something. We went out for supper, and he was telling me how wonderful it was. He said, all oh, this BS we were fed as, you know, as, as young students, and we were taught you know, in catechism that about chastity, poverty, and obedience. We really wanted sex, authority, and money. You know, He's liberated himself from that and so on. And he had, except he wasn't very happy. Uh, he was telling me, you know, he was protesting how much he had come from his back Catholic background, and now he was just free, and I was going to say, and very unhappy young man. You know, he went into every dark place to prove, I can go there and it doesn't kill me. And the sisters who taught me were wrong. Uh, they weren't very really wrong because I was looking at a very unhappy man. See, we can go into every dark place. In fact, it doesn't kill us. Not only, have, not only doesn't kill us, we get really smart when we get there. Remember in the Adam and Eve story, we often forget that line. After they ate the apple, their minds weren't darkened, the way our catechism said. Their eyes were opened. They got really smart. You only get really smart, just start breaking every taboo on the planet. You'll have a lot of insight. You're going to be unhappy as hell. But you, you'll be real smart, you know? See, conservatives and their instinct, they get this. And that's why the great conservative line is always careful, careful, careful. Sometimes it's too many careful, but that's the instinct. See, be careful, be careful, be careful. Um, my dad used to say, you're playing with fire. You're playing with fire, be careful. He was right, okay? Now, second instinct of conservatism, every kingdom needs to be protected. See, conservatives aren't naive in this sense. Whether it's your country, whether it's your city, whether it's your marriage, whether it's your family, whether it's your church, it does have to be protected. Any kingdom without guards and without walls is sooner going to be overrun. Okay. Um, remember Robert Moore was one of my mentors. He said, uh, he said I went through the late '60s that when we used to stick, you know, uh, flowers into to barrels of guns. He says, as you know, as if we could have, you know world peace simply by having sex. He said, it doesn't work that easy. <laughs> it's going to take some cops and some policemen and so, and so on. Okay. Third area, and very importantly, sexuality has always been seen as a very important and non-exempt area. See, too often in liberal ideology, we can split off sexuality and say, well, you know, we're for justice and we're for this and so on, and, and our own private lives are not that important. Big mistake. And with that comes a strong pressure on family so that See, the conservative instinct about you have to have a healthy sexuality, and that's ultimately going to protect family life. That's right. Okay. And liberals at their worst have been cavalier about <coughs> family life. Okay. Then, fourthly, conservatives write, there are absolutes. And when people say, you know, Einstein said there are no absolutes. No, it's not Einstein at all. Einstein said there are absolutes. You can't know them absolutely. But there are absolutes. 
certain things are right and certain things are wrong, and it's not all relative, you know. And if you quote Einstein, quote him correctly, he didn't say there are no absolutes. He said, but it's very important, which conservatives sometimes don't get, and that is you can't know them absolutely, though. There are absolutes, but my expression and version of the absolute may not be the absolute, okay? But there are absolutes. And then lastly, very importantly, again, this is in, in the healthy conservative instinct, that deep archetypal structures should not be tampered with irresponsibly. What's a deep archetypal structure? See, that, that's the conservative, I'll give you one example. That's the conservative nervousness right now about gay marriage. They say, you know, like, there's an archetypal structure that works at the level of atoms, through trees, through human beings, through animals, in which, you know, it works on the basis of male and female. That's the normative kind of coming together and so on. And if you define another kind of marriage as equally normative, you start tampering with that. And then what's it going to mean? See, that's the instinct. You see, you know, there's, there's deep structures. Um, or even like we're realizing that with ecology, our planet has a certain structure. If we cut down too many trees, um, we're going to run out of oxygen. See, there, there's, there's deep structures. That's the old, that's just, those are examples of the old classical thing called natural law. There's a natural law that you simply have to respect. You can tamper with it a little bit, but if you overdo it, you're going to pay a huge price. That's one of the strengths of the conservative instinct. Now, liberals. Liberals at their best. It's insight. That freedom is a divine gift. You know, freedom isn't something you denigrate in God's name or try to take away from people. Freedom is, freedom is a divine gift, and in the West it's been bought at a great historical price. Millions of people have had to die so that you and I can be free the way we are. Don't take that for granted and don't give it back. You know, that's why you see a very different, just as one example, after 9-11. Conservatives, we got to protect ourselves. Circumscribed, you know, we'll give up our liberties. And liberals, no, no, no. You know, uh, freedom was bought at a great price, and you don't give it up. You simply don't. Too many millions of people have died to give this to us. It's a great gift from God. Most people on the planet have never had it. Most don't have it. We have it. Uh, that's the liberal instinct, and it's right. And it should never, especially, be denigrated in God's name. See. The opposite of a liberal is the, tal the Taliban, you know. God doesn't want you to have this. Some cleric from above has to tell you how to live your life. That will just simply send a liberal to an early grave, you know. Um, then, it's interesting, these things they counterbalance each other. The great, the great conservative line is careful, 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 okay. My dad was conservative, he was a wonderful man, and those were the words, in fact, those were his last words to me before he died, you know. I was leaving his hospital bed, drive home, said, no, now drive carefully, careful, okay. Um, <laughs> now, the great liberal line, which has a lot of truth to it, is there's an equal risk in being too safe. Goethe, the famous German poet, used to say, the dangers of life are many, and safety is one of those dangers. It's true. See, the dangers of life are many, and safety is one of the dangers. When you raise kids, that's the tension. You can cut them too little slack, and you'll stunt them. You can cut them too much slack and they hurt themselves. So there's an equal danger. There's an equal danger in never saying, careful, careful, careful. And there's also an equal danger in saying, careful, careful, careful. You know, the dangers of life are many and safety is one of those dangers. See, and the healthy liberal thing is, you know, you can be too safe. And you know what happens? You're this very solid, petrified, uh, unhappy, older brother of the, of the prodigal son. Remember, he played everything safe. Now he's old and he's bitter as a slave. I've never left home and he's jealous of the guy who did and so on. He's not inside the father's house. He played it too safe, okay? Then, thirdly, historically, the church and the culture. The church and Western culture have been too anti-erotic and too unfair to both the non-white races and to women. That's just an historical truth, you know? A lot of people object to that, you, you can't, you know? Nobody, um, can look historically at Christianity in the West and say that, for instance, that, that we've had a healthy relationship to Eros or that we haven't been racist and that we haven't been sexist. You know, um, I mean, that's just, that's like saying there's weather outside. And no, to our credit, we're, we're getting better. But um, 
sometimes conservatives simply flat out deny that. Just, no, no, no. Well, what about slavery up to the year 1900? What about the status of women even today? What about the status of, of uh, non-whites and so on? They know that real clearly. Uh, sometimes we don't know that. And then fourthly and very importantly, liberalism knows that the opposite of secularity is not the church but the Taliban. Um, and then lastly, that the great instinct of that's healthy in liberalism is that Catholicity is about a wide, inclusive embrace. That in my father's house there are many rooms. And that's why I see that the, the conservative instinct which is healthy is to protect. Be careful, be careful. The liberal instinct that's healthy is to say, no, everybody's brother and sister, everybody come in, come in. You know, uh, remember we sing, sing that song, everybody's welcome at this table. That's a liberal song. So, you know, <laughs> Well, what, what if he isn't baptized? What if he's in? A, what if he's in a marriage that isn't right? And what if this is just to come? You know, you know, everybody's welcome at this table. Now, you see, they both bring something very, very powerful and healthy, but both of us have our faults, and so the the purpose of this is for us to be able to name some of this for ourselves and say, like, um, um, because by temperament we're going to be liberal or conservative, and that's a temperament. It's like the color of your skin or your gender. It's just dealt to you. Some of us wake up and we're temperamentally liberals, and some of us wake up and we're temperamentally conservatives. You know, I will say, you know, the great archetypal line of the two. See, um, the great archetypal line of a conservative is nothing should be done for the first time. <laughs> okay. Okay. The great archetypal line of I have a priest friend, and he is truly a liberal. He's off a, out of a catalog, out of the liberal catalog, and he always says, "My philosophy is this." He said, if it's moving, get on board. He said, and if it isn't moving, get it going. And if you can't move it, then paint it. But do something with it, you know. See, it's got to change. It's got to, you know, get outside the box and so on. And there, there's a certain health. There's a certain wonderful health in both of them. And, and yet there's a certain danger in both of them. And yet the church needs both of them. Society needs both of them. Liberals and conservatives hate each other. But you know something? We desperately need each other. In every family, in every community, in every church, in every city, in every country, you need it to be healthy. You need a strong conserving principle and a strong liberalizing principle. If you have too strong a conserving principle, what happens is you begin to petrify, become intolerant, become narrow, um, become biased, and so on. If you have too strong a liberalizing principle, you begin to fall apart. See, one liberals open the the so on, conservatives shut, and the two together should keep you open and shut just enough that you're anchored. And you know, and those are the two principles of the soul. You know, the human soul has two fundamental things it does to you. It's your principle of unity. It keeps everything together, and it's your principle of life. And you see that if you ever watch somebody die, the second the soul leaves the body, you know it, and those two things disappear. One of them is, up until that time, there's tension. There's a certain energy in the body. The second the soul dies, the body's inert. See, the life principle, the fire is all gone. But also, when the soul leaves, the glue of the body is gone. See, up until that point, everything works together. The second you die, the body starts to disintegrate and go its own way. It simply dissipates into chemicals. Okay, That's also the soul of a church, of a society, of a family. You need both. You need fire. You need something to keep the engines driving and so on, to create energy, to create vision, to create newness. It's the liberal principle. And you need something to conserve, to hold, to anchor, to protect. That's the, the conservative principle. And when one or the other principle knocks the other one out, your health will go very, very soon. And when what happens historically, both in churches and cultures, is invariably we do the pendulum thing. It's too liberal, then it becomes too conservative, then it becomes too, then it becomes too liberal, and liberals, conservatives, and basically we feed off each other. We're a parasite. You know, bad liberalism spawns fundamentalism, and bad fun fundamentalism spawns excessive liberalism, and we just go back, forth, back, forth, and so on. Um, whereas, in fact, we need both. So that it, it's good to look at this and say, okay, as we go out to seed, and in this case, especially to our own kids and our own communities and so on, to know we're liberal or conservative by temperament, and then your place in the parish you're in and where the church is at at a given moment and so on. 
to be able to name these things and to be able to healthily work with both. To say here we need a liberal application. Here we need a conservative application. You know, when I, was, I, I read this when I was too young to fully understand it, except the line stunned me and I wrote it down and I've gotten to kind of understand it since. But in the diaries of Malcolm X, he said, I'll always be a Christian. He said, that's where I'm at. He said, but I've become a Muslim, he said, because I'm working in the ghettos. I'm trying to help people. He said, his lives are just in shambles. He said, they need the discipline of Allah. He said, later on, when their lives are more together, he said, they can, I can, I'll give them the liberal gospel of Jesus. It's quite a, quite a line. See, the discipline of Allah and later on the gospel of Jesus. I was telling some of you at the break, when I was teaching in Seattle one summer, it was just when Promise Keepers, in the early 90s, when Promise Keepers were so strong in North America. So being curious, there was one at the, at the kingdom in Seattle, and like 60,000 men came out. And first of all, I was quite impressed. I thought, when you get 60,000 men in a football stadium without a ball, <laughs> that's got to be a good thing, you know? Okay. And, you know, the people preaching, it was pretty conservative, fundamentalist stuff. And yet it was powerful. It was very, very powerful. It wasn't, you know, where my liberal students were at. It wasn't where I was at. I'm not picking one of these guys to be my spiritual director. But they were doing some wonderful things. And one of the things, just an earthy thing, at a certain point, the... the the preacher up there, he had some of his, his body guys, they brought out sacks of quarters, bags with quarters in them, they set them on the podium and he says, now, and he was preaching about men being faithful to their wives, giving up drinking, going back home at night, he says, all the men here who have committed adultery and cheated your wife, I want you to come and take a quarter and go to the nearest payphone and phone her and apologize. A lot of men did this and so on. See, that's 12 step at its at its best. See, kind of, you do this, you do that. That's not the liberal gospel of Jesus. You're not going to find a passage in Scripture for that, you know. See, that's a, that's a start. That's where you begin, you know. That was a very conservative gathering because a very conservative gathering was needed. Henry Nowen would not have scored the same that day. Neither would Ron Rollheiser or anybody else. See, this group, they needed this. Do this, write it down, take the step, nail it down, so on. It's a start. See, and the conservatives are right. Be, a lot of times before you can do certain things, certain other things have to be done. And, and then vice versa, sometimes they're wrong. And then after those things have been done, then you move on to something else. Then it's the end of the 12 step and phoning your wife with a quarter. Then you better go on a retreat with Thomas Keating and get into centering prayer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, now is the time for you to become an elder, to open your spirit, to do some other things, and so on. So it's not a question of one's right or one's wrong. There are times. Scripture says there's a season. There's a season to be born, a season to die. There's a season to be liberal. There's a season to be conservative. There's an occasion to be liberal. There's an occasion to be conservative, and so on. So when we go and see the word, that's why I took all this time in this talk, it's so important that we recognize that, that... Uh, um, it's not whether I'm a liberal or I'm a conservative, and I have a liberal agenda or a conservative agenda. Don't have an agenda. Jim Wallace always says, don't be a liberal, don't be a conservative. Be a woman or a man of faith and compassion and missiology, and just go where that takes you. And sometimes you bring out the sack of quarters, <laughs> and other times you bring out Henry Nowen and Thomas Keating and so on. Um, and then the same in your own life what you might need at your stage as an elder. I'm taking for granted, and I don't mean this as an idle compliment, every one of you in this room, you're an elder, you're mature in the faith. You don't need to have steps numbered for you, and I'm doing this and so on. You're meant to carry all these things, and you're meant to be transcendent already, where liberal and conservative, you, that you're empathic to both. You embrace conservatives and try to help them in the what's best in their agenda. You embrace liberals and try to help them what's best in their agenda. And you try to do everything. Paul says, I'm all things to all people. To liberals, I'm liberal. To conservatives, I'm conservative. So it's not that you're being wishy-washy. That's what an elder does because both are needed. And so that, that you realize, this is not about me. And it's not even about, see, what you do in your own life is important. And, you know, who is your spiritual director and who feeds you and who nurses you well, nurtures you? It'll probably be some liberal author or whatever. Uh, but that isn't necessarily what your kids need. You know, it isn't necessarily what 
if you're running an RCIA, what they need, and so on, and vice versa. If you're committed, conservative, and it's, it's the abortion issue and this and so on, um, okay, pick your own spiritual director, but that isn't what everybody in society needs. And it doesn't mean Obama can't speak at Notre Dame and all kinds of stuff like that. I see your elders, you know, we're the sowers, and I'm challenging us to try to be more like the sower. Christ was transcendent to all of this. A couple of very quick principles, because we're winding down. It's going to be the last three principles on your, on your sheets. And that is, as we do this, this is my suggestion. Be for what you are more than against what you're against. See, as, as, a, as, a, as a sower, that's one of the Jesus. See, Jesus wasn't against a lot of things. Jesus was for a lot of things. You know, and so often in our religious discourse, in our parish life, and so on, almost all the fights are about what you're against. You know, I'm against, I'm against, I'm against, I'm against. At a certain point, that's not going to help the kids. What are you for? What are you for? Not so much, what are you against? Your kids already know that. Try to show youth and so on, what am I for? What's positive? Okay, then. Be compassionate, gracious, and understanding, even as you hold your moral ground. See, as an elder, you, you embrace indiscriminately, like the father, the prodigal son, you know. The weakness of the young, the anger of the old, everything in between. But it doesn't mean you condone it all. So you hold your moral ground, even as you're gracious and compassionate. Just a classical example, I use it because it's so simple and time is short, but this, you know. So your son or daughter is living with his or her boyfriend. They come home for the weekend to your house. They're going to stay together in the same room. You say, not in my house. No. Well, we live together anyway. We're going to do it. Say, yes, but not here. See, you're gracious, but you're clear. You don't say, well, you're not my daughter or whatever. Or the first time your daughter comes home and says, I'm moving with my boyfriend, you know. Um, don't necessarily throw her out of the house, but you make it clear. I don't approve of this. Well, you're a different generation. We have different values, and you don't understand this. And fine, I don't approve it. I think it's wrong, and I think it's a dumb decision. I think it's wrong. Uh, you're still my daughter. And I'm going to embrace you. I love you. But see, you hold your ground on everything, not just the sexuality, but it's such a clear example. See, you are who you are. You're an elder. You hold your ground, but you do it graciously, and you can embrace everybody, but they know who you are. They know my. <laughs> Mom doesn't approve of this. She loves me, but she doesn't approve of it. Uh, see, that's, that's the missiological stance. You know, you go in, that's, you, precisely, they're in a different culture. You're the missionary in that culture. You're coming in with values from the outside, okay? And you, you're generous, but, but you're clear about your values. So you don't cave in. Don't say, well, I guess the whole world's doing it. It's got to be okay, and so on. Then, then you've given up your ground, you know? Then you're salt, you're without savor. See, salt has to have salt to it. Uh, and yet at the same time, the elder embraces, the elder understands, so you've got to be empathic and so on. And then lastly, our task is to witness to health, calmness, life, gratitude, forgiveness, and humor. So I put this last and read, it's the most important. You know what your kids need to see from us? They need to see health. I once went to a workshop by Lachlan Sofield on leadership. It was a wonderful workshop, and he says, as a leader, okay, I'm going to give it to you as a parent, as a, an uncle, as a minister, as, you know, um, he'd say the most important single thing you have to radiate is health. People have to see that you're healthy, that you have a certain zest for life, that you know, if they see you as half dead, all of the other stuff is useless. You might do all the right things. You've got to radiate some life. It's the same with our kids. The kids want to, they want to see you alive and healthy. You know, not, oh, I'm for Jesus, but, you know, uh, nobody wants to be in a room with a suck the oxygen out of a room, you know. Uh, you got to bring oxygen into the room, not suck it out, you know. And that's, that's not just abstract. So you got to radiate certain calmness. You don't panic. You know, certain appreciation of life. You enjoy wine and you enjoy life and so on. Uh, and a certain gratitude. As we get older, our lives better be more marked by gratitude than anger and bitterness. So often we're radiating bitterness. Man, the government and those guys are rotten and the parish is rotten and the, everything's rotten. We're not radiating much. See, that's what we're against. It's not about anything we're for. You know, they're grateful, you know. 
if you're over 50 and you're alive, you've already won the lottery, you know? <laughs> and every day is a bonus. And, uh, and if you're healthy, it's a double bonus. And if you can get wine for supper tonight, it's a triple bonus, you know? <laughs> and be grateful for that. You know, Morris West, the great Catholic novelist, he, he wrote a little autobiography when his 75th birthday. I mean, he released on his 75th birthday. Wonderful little thing called The View from the Ridge. He said, when you're 75 years old, he said, the way I am, wife, kids, he said, and you're still healthy, there should only be three words left in your vocabulary, three phrases. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. So that's all that's, all that's left to say. I'm 75 years old, I'm healthy, I have people who love me. It's enough, it's enough. If you can have wine besides, so much the better, you know. <laughs> Forgiveness and humor. See, humor is precisely the opposite of grandiosity where conservatism hangs itself sometimes, it loses its sense of humor, you know? And then as soon as we lose our humor, we become grandiose. But how can you laugh? This is so serious, and the, the blessed sacraments involved here, and so on. It's grandiose. God doesn't need our protection. Have a laugh. Not tritely or something, but uh, humor is a sign of your own humility. Humor is a certain sign of humility. The incapacity to laugh is a sign of pride. I'm so important, and this is so important that I personally have to save the world here. That's grandiose as hell, you know? It's good that we have court gestures in our culture. You know, the David Letterman's and Jay Leno's that deflate that all. They say, don't take yourself so serious. This is something little called life. It's okay, you know? Have a laugh. And, and I leave that for the end, but it's important. What our kids really need to see us do, and I've named some other things, they need to see our fidelity. They need to see, you know, our maturity, and they also need to see our health. Hold your ground, be gracious, don't see the world going, but stand there as a healthy woman, a healthy man who enjoys your life, uh, doesn't knock you off your feet, and so on. You're very clear what you believe in and what you don't believe in. You send out very clear signals. As the great poet William Stafford used to say, let your yes be a yes, and let your no be a no. He said, because the darkness around us is deep. Don't be ambiguous. Be real clear, but be healthy. <laughs> Enjoy and be a gracious presence the way Christ was. Thank you. Mm -hmm.